implementation has been going on in a number of countries for a number of years now and we've seen some interesting stuff over the last year or so. I'd like to share with you some of the successes and some ideas that we've got around making sure that you get the best value for money out of your implementation. We've seen a number of positive changes within those forces where emails have been implemented. Some of them you would think it's not rocket science, it's nothing new, but actually with the clarified roles and responsibilities and the developed competencies to contribute to continuous improvement in the system, we've started to see some great benefits that have probably had a major impact on, of course, the reliability of the aircraft, but also ultimately to the safety of the aircraft themselves. Those benefits can be accrued from an effective quality system whereby internal quality audits are really contributing to tangible improvements in uh, processes and procedures, making it easier for people to actually do a good job. We also see airworthiness reviews that are turning up airworthiness issues that have been in place and being tolerated for quite some time. And finally, we see senior commanders asking questions of their team. How airworthy is my aircraft? How safe is my aircraft? What are we doing about that recurrent issue that I became aware of last month? So overall, the EMAS can contribute to an improvement in performance, not only from an airworthiness perspective, the overall success of the Air Force. The regulator's role is pretty demanding. On one hand, they are empowered frequently to remove approvals or to ground aircraft. On the other hand, they probably know more about the regulations and their intent than anybody else within the system. But to be truly independent, they cannot act as an advisor. But at the same time, they need to encourage and steer organisations in the direction that they can achieve the desired output. So the behaviour of the auditors the way in which the MAA conducts itself through its leadership and its communication, its promotion of safety, are important aspects that should be considered when implementing the EMARS. If you ignore the MAA's competencies and its behaviour, then it's just a procedural change around an old concept that we've been working with for many years called airworthiness. So the benefits will only be accrued if the MAA actually takes a different approach to that that's been taken in the past. It's good to see some authorities now actually really looking at defining its behaviours, the way in which it will work, and really looking at some of the softer competencies that contribute to its success. Thankfully, there's an increasing recognition that adoption of the EMARS is the best way to go. We've seen a number of nations in the past that have taken the core documents and then adapted them or edited them to make them fit into their national systems. This has caused problems with mutual recognition and cross-border cooperation. It's made it more difficult for nations to actually work together and it has certainly hindered commercial organisations from using a single approval across a whole range of different countries. So the benefits that were accrued under the JAA system years ago, which is really mirrored now by the way in which the EMARS are um, being implemented as requirements, um, were really best recognised at the time by the countries accepting that they needed to actually release some of their long-held beliefs about the things that actually contributed to safety performance. So national requirements that had emanated from um, a bad experience with accidents or incidents are recognised that those are difficult to let go of. But what organisations should be able to do now is to actually take the requirement, apply it within their organisation, and then address national differences, if necessary, and they should be minimised as far as possible, within the expositions and within lower level guidance that could be um, provided within the individual nations, if absolutely necessary. 
In this way, it clearly helps organisations to actually compete uh, and to actually bring some of the benefits that were envisaged from the EMARS in the early days um, for those joint operations um, and uh, mutual recognition in particular but actually allowing people to move around the system where necessary and building confidence that actually one nation's servicemen can travel in another nation's aircraft safely. This can all be recognised with a cleaner adoption of the EMARS rather than that adaptation that I've talked about. Competence is a consistent requirement within all of the EMARS. And yet it is something that organisations have struggled with for some time. Whilst it's fairly easy to ensure that a person has the technical skills and the technical knowledge to be able to do the job that they've been allocated, they then struggle with some of the softer issues that need to be addressed. And particularly as safety management becomes more important within the system and as the EMARs develop to integrate SMS, then we'll find that some of the softer competencies that are required to deal with error, to actually understand what a violation is, to actually deal with a just culture and to deal with the human as a whole within the system takes a different set of skills. Leaders will need to be able to respond in ways that will encourage their people to report, to support good investigations, and then to be brave enough to actually respond to some of the organisational issues that may well have set up an individual to fail. But generally, competencies have not been well defined in the past. If you look into an exposition and you look at a particular role and you look at what is actually defined there for the individual, it sometimes falls way short in terms of the actual skills that an individual needs to do his job. So what we're starting to see now is organisations, units, that are starting to identify some of the softer skills that people need, as well as those technical issues. So that's it for today. Um, be very interested to talk to anybody that has any particular challenges as they go forward with EMAR implementation or want to get a better performance out of them, for example.